Do you know what's in Hanford's backyard? Hanford was selected as one of the sites in the Manhattan Project. The other two major sites were Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico and Clinton Engineer Works in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Clinton Engineer Works was responsible for separating sufficient amounts of fissionable uranium to serve as fuel for nuclear weapons. Los Alamos was assigned the task to design and fabricate the world's first atomic bomb. Hanford was responsible for producing a sufficient supply of weapons-grade plutonium for the bomb. The Hanford location was selected in December 1942. The U.S. had been involved in World War II for approximately a year, and Colonel Franklin T. Mathis was tasked with scouting the western United States to find a suitable site for plutonium production facilities. The ideal location would be large, remote, and close to running water for reactor cooling and hydroelectric power. It also needed to be flat, accessible, and reasonably inland to protect it as a target from potential air raids. This was all for the United States' attempt at being the first nation to develop a superweapon capable of putting an end to the war. There were three towns in the area at the time, Hanford, White Bluffs, and Richland, all small farming communities founded between 1905 and 1910, with a combined population of approximately 1,500. Under the War Powers Act, the U.S. government acquired 625 square miles of the Mid-Columbia Basin, offering compensation to each of the nearly 1,500 previous inhabitants. The primary contractor building facility was the DuPont Company. Due to being accused of war profiteering after World War I, they only asked for one dollar over the cost of construction. The construction project was completed early, and the DuPont Company only received 67 cents. Between March 1943 and August 1945, workers built 554 non-residential buildings. Among these were the B, D, and F reactors, 64 underground waste storage tanks, and the new city of Richland capable of housing 17,500 people. Plutonium production reactors were separated from each other by at least one mile. Three initial plutonium separation plants, T, U, and B, were used to extract usable plutonium from the irradiated uranium fuel rods were one mile from each other and four miles from the reactors. The first and possibly most significant reactor was the B reactor. The B reactor was the first full-scale nuclear production reactor in the world. Plutonium produced by the B reactor was used for both the first atomic bomb called the Gadget and Fat Man. The atomic bomb dropped over Nagasaki, Japan to end World War II. One of the fathers of the atomic bomb, J. Robert Oppenheimer, was reported as saying, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. After witnessing the detonation of the Gadget at the White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico on July 16, 1945. From 1945 to the end of the Cold War, B Reactor and eight others produced the majority of the nation's weapons grade plutonium. Plutonium production at Hanford peaked between 1956 and 1964, with all nine reactors along the river making plutonium. N Reactor, the newest, had several new features, including both weapons production and commercial electrical power. Also, it had a closed-loop primary cooling system to eliminate discharges to the Columbia River. In the mid-1960s, the nation's plutonium stockpile was larger than needed, causing plutonium production to slow. By 1969, all reactors, except N-Reactor, were closed down. The Chernobyl explosion in 1986 led to a shutdown of N-Reactor to assess its ability to operate safely. With the end of the Cold War in 1989, there was no need to continue production. N-Reactor was transitioned to cold standby, and the mission at Hanford switched from production to cleanup. Environmental risks were not always considered in the early days of Hanford, as was shown by the early disposal techniques of dumping low-level liquid waste back into the soil. A study by GE showed this practice led to mounds developing in the groundwater under the 200 east and west areas. This practice contributed to the contamination of roughly 80 square miles of groundwater beneath the Hanford site. This is roughly the size of the land area of the city of Seattle. With the cleanup effort, a study done in 1994 showed that the groundwater level was still 85 feet higher than pre-production levels. Also, water used to cool the reactors in an open-loop system was allowed to cool, then immediately be released back into the Columbia River. High-level waste, however, has always been disposed of in underground holding structures known as tanks. There are two kinds, single-shell and double-shell. Single-shell tanks are holding bins made of carbon steel surrounded by reinforced concrete and buried underground. Double-shell tanks have a second shell of carbon steel surrounding the concrete and carbon steel and are equipped with leak detection systems. However, space has always been limited. 64 single-shell tanks were built during World War II, and by the end of the war, half were completely full, and the other half of the tanks were 40% full. By 1952, 60 more tanks had been built. No tanks reported leaks before the early 1950s. However, some fittings made from anything other than stainless steel did leak as early as 1945. The first significant confirmed leak occurred at 104U in 1956. The largest known leak from a Hanford single-shell tank was found in 1973 and was 115,000 gallons from tank 106T. This is equal to approximately 2,090 barrels of oil, or 460,000 one-quart sports drinks, or the average amount of water used in 3,286 10-minute showers. That is one shower a day for nine years, and that's just from the single largest leak. The total amount of waste material leaked from underground tanks is believed to be 10 times this amount. 149 single-shell tanks were built between 1943 and 1964. 67 of these tanks are presumed to have leaked. However, of the 28 double-shell tanks built from 1968 to 1986, none are known to be leaking. Regulation of the Hanford cleanup began in 1989 with the signing of the Tri-Party Agreement, signed between the Department of Energy, 
the Washington State Department of Ecology, and the United States Environmental Protection Agency. The full name of the agreement is the Hanford Federal Facility Agreement and Consent Order. This outlined a 30-year cleanup schedule to bring the Hanford site into compliance with state and federal environmental laws. The agreement is made up of action plans that include milestones, or deadlines, for specific cleanup actions to be completed. And each major milestone is made up of several interim milestones guiding cleanup activities throughout the course of cleanup. The agreement also outlines the process for changing, removing, or adding milestones, the conditions under which penalties may be issued, and the requirements for public participation pertaining to Hanford cleanup actions. Changes can be made to the Tri-Party Agreement with the approval of all three agencies. The change request process can be initiated by any of the Tri-Parties, and a public participation process must be followed prior to any changes being implemented. The site was divided into six administrative areas, known as the 100, 200, 300, 400, 600, 700, and 1100 areas. The 100 area includes the 90 activated nuclear reactors along the northern stretch of the Columbia River. The 200 area is divided into east and west areas. It is located in Hanford's central plateau, which is where the underground tanks for storing waste are located. Also in the 200 area are the principal nuclear, chemical, processing, and waste management facilities. The 300 area is approximately three miles north of the city of Richland and contains research and development laboratories and former reactor fuel manufacturing facilities. The Fast Flux Test Facility, also known as the FFTF, was an experimental reactor initially designed to test new fuels for the breeder reactors. It was later used to produce medical isotopes. It is located in the 400 area and lies about nine miles northwest of the 300 area. The 600 area designation was given to the land in the Hanford area that is not part of any other administrative area. The 700 area refers to the federal building in the city of Richland. The 1100 area is located adjacent to the Richland city limits and once contained vehicle maintenance and storage facilities. This also contains the Hanford Patrol Academy and is where the Horn Rapids landfill is currently located. Some of the waste was placed in steel drums or wooden boxes before being buried, while some of the other wastes were placed in the ground without a container to hold it. Waste in the tanks consists of liquid, gases, semi-solids, and solids. All of the liquid waste that can be safely pumped out of a single shell tank and transferred into double shell tanks has taken place. Work now consists of transferring the solid and semi-solid wastes into the double shell tanks. Currently, scientists and engineers at Hanford are busy cleaning up all the garbage and waste that was made while nuclear reactors were making plutonium. As directed by Congress, the Office of River Protection was established in 1998 to manage the Department of Energy's largest, most complex environmental cleanup project. There are several strategies in place to help consolidate and contain hazardous waste. One strategy is simply to block the groundwater contamination from getting to the Columbia. Various kinds of barriers are placed in the ground which allow the clean groundwater to move through while chemically altering any harmful contamination into a non-toxic form as it passes through. Another strategy in dealing with the groundwater contamination is called biostimulation. This is a new technology where crews pump materials like molasses and vegetable oil into the ground where tiny microorganisms in the soil eat the molasses and vegetable oil. The microorganisms then reproduce and in doing so they alter the chemistry of the groundwater and render the contaminants harmless to the environment. The process also prevents the contamination from moving any closer to the river. All of the waste liquids must be pumped out of the underground storage tanks and into a facility called the waste treatment plant, also called the vitrification plant or vit plant. The waste treatment plant will turn the liquid waste into solid glass logs, which can be safely stored for a thousand years without harming people or the environment. It is the largest environmental construction project in the world. It will be fully operational in 2022. The Environmental Restoration Disposal Facility, or ERDF, is a specially designed landfill to store low-level radioactive waste and is the size of 52 football fields. The landfill's walls are constructed with several liners comprised of special materials designed to prevent waste from leaking into the ground. However, should some of the waste leak through one liner, monitoring equipment and strong pumps retrieve the leaked waste and send it upward to the surface where a treatment facility extracts the leaked waste from the water. The treated water is returned to the ground while the waste is returned to the landfill. Currently, ERDF contains 11 million tons of waste with the capacity to store more. The remaining estimated cost of the Hanford cleanup is between $103.9 to $115 billion over the next 41 years. This is about twice Microsoft founder Bill Gates' net worth. In terms of the average American salary of $44,410 a year, it would take approximately 2.5 million years to pay for the project. The current cleanup effort is going well. The groundwater contamination over drinking standards today is eight square miles smaller than it was in 1994. Also, underground mounds produced by dumping liquids back into the soil are only approximately 30 feet high. More than 235 facilities will be decommissioned, deactivated, decontaminated, and demolished in the next four years in a milestone known as Hanford Vision 2015. It is expected that Hanford will not be completely cleaned up until about 2052. 60% by volume of the nation's high-level radioactive waste is stored at Hanford in aging, deteriorating tanks. If not cleaned up, this waste is a threat to the Columbia River and the Pacific Northwest. Even though cleanup efforts continue at the Hanford site, the Department of Energy acknowledges that the contamination cannot be removed completely. Therefore, they have developed the long-term stewardship program to address the problem. How does this affect young people today, and why should they care? Young people will have to make decisions that affect the success and direction of the new program. Here are two possible choices. First, they may choose to ignore Hanford altogether. 
but there are consequences that will directly affect them. If young people do not participate in the cleanup efforts at Hanford, there will be no knowledgeable and experienced workers in the future to complete Hanford's mission. Therefore, the untreated contamination remains and continues to threaten the general public and the environment. If young people show no interest in Hanford's mission, then why should the three major parties, the Department of Energy, Washington State Department of Ecology, and the Environmental Protection Agency, hold themselves accountable to people who don't care. If the federal government sees a lack of interest in Hanford's mission, the federal government may decide to decrease funding and scale back cleanup efforts at Hanford. Decreased funding at Hanford would result in many unhappy unemployed workers who have to move away from the Tri-Cities to find other jobs. Since the Tri-Cities economy depends greatly on federal support, when workers along with their families move away from the Tri-Cities, its economy will destabilize. However, if the youth decide to take an active part in Hanford's future, many benefits will arise. There will be experienced people to fulfill waste storage management positions in the future. Important projects and facilities such as the Environmental Restoration Disposal Facility, the Vitrification Plant, Tank Farms, cocooned reactors, and Columbia Generating Station will either be completed or continue to operate. The Department of Energy completes its cleanup mission and moves into long-term stewardship. With the transition from cleanup stewardship, Hanford's natural resources, which were not previously available, would be open to the public and private enterprises. How can young people become more involved? Young people can vote on the issues that affect Hanford's operation and approve more funding as needed by the federal and state governments. Young people can voice opinions at public events and forums that discuss changes in the tri-party agreement by all three major participants. Department of Energy, Washington State Department of Ecology, and Environmental Protection Agency. Young people can directly affect the progress at Hanford's mission by working on the site. What are you going to do?